Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, I'm very excited to introduce our guest to you. But before I do, I want to thank some people that we always thank. We want to thank BrassAndWinds.com. Brass and Winds are our friends in the music industry who offer us musical instruments whenever we need them here at Willow Music. We suggest you check them out at BrassAndWinds.com. Thank you for watching Truer MU. You are now in my musical mind, and I hope you enjoy it in there. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you now to a friend of mine. Well, here's a little background about my friend. Uh, we have been in two bands together over the years, uh, a band called Patience Grasshopper and another band called Front Porch Session Players. I've greatly enjoyed working with him. He's also represented me in legal work. Uh, he is a lawyer. Let me tell you a little bit about him. His name is Christopher Burney. Christopher Burney is a lawyer operating in Atlanta, Georgia. He received a BA, MBA, and JD from Duke University and was admitted to the State Bar of Georgia in 1997. He focuses on working with business owners, entrepreneurs, and artists. He is also a guitarist and songwriter. Chris Burney, welcome to our show. Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me, man. It's great to be here. It's great to have you here. Um, I want to talk about you, but first let's just talk about the law for people who are interested in how the law intersects with the arts. Sound good? Sure. Okay. Let's say um, as a musician, you need a lawyer. Uh, sh can anyone help you? Could you just go to any lawyer you want and just say, hey, can you help? Or is there someone in particular you should be looking for? That's a good question. You know, I think that the kind of lawyer that someone is looking for, you know, everyone's going to say, well, it's got to be an entertainment lawyer and only an entertainment lawyer can help you. But I think anyone that does intellectual property work would be able to help you do the kinds of things that, um, you know, artists need done, protecting their rights, copywriting their work, you know, in some cases, uh, trademarking certain elements of their work um, in terms of the, how they're presenting themselves to the, to the world. Um, but copyright's really the big one. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, a series of releases and other documents that any intellectual property lawyer will know. Um, as you move up through the complexity of the agreements, you're going to want someone with entertainment law background if, for nothing else is that they tend to have their sort of ear to the track and they know what market rate is on certain things. And, you know, it's very difficult to give good legal advice if you don't have that ability. Uh, so what would you intellectual property? Uh, I, I think we hear that all the time, but is there a good definition for it? Intellectual property basically comprises of three things. It's copyright, trademark, and patent work. Patent work is generally outside the entertainment world and the artist world, unless they've created some, some, some device or some combination of technologies to create art. But uh, most of them are going to be dealing with copyright and trademark. And basically, we're talking about intangible rights that are capable of being protected. You know, people get confused about copyright because they say, well, um, oh, I have a copyright in this, you know, because I put the C in the circle at the bottom of my, on my record, you know, on my, on my, on my EP, on the CD, it's right there. It says C in a circle, you know, big boy music or whatever the name of my publishing company is. But really that's, that's not true. To have the C in the circle denotes that you've registered your trademark with the federal government, which is a separate step. And um, one that is, highly encouraged because it gives the, the holder of the copyright, the owner of the copyright, improved remedies for enforcing infringement on the right. The minute you take an expression and affix it into a tangible medium, like a song on a tape or a poem on a paper or uh, paint on a canvas, you have created, you have a common law copyright. Copyright is one of the oldest um, ideas in the law, along with trademark. You have it already. It's common law. You can sue people for it without ever registering your trademark. But you're going to have a harder time, you know, making it a good recovery for you if you don't have a registered trademark. A registered trademark gives you, you know, triple damages in some cases, allows you to get your attorney's fees paid. There are statutory damages that you can elect as opposed to proving actual damages. So it's a much more robust suite of um, procedures and remedies that you can pursue. Um, yeah. Why is that? Why is uh, having it registered with the government going to provide you with more damages? 
Well, because there's statutes out there, the Lanham Act particularly, um, that and, and the Copyright Act that basically says, you know, if someone infringes on a copyright and that copyright's been registered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, then you get the remedies that are available in this in this suite of statutes in this section, and that's where those stat that's where those remedies are codified. Uh, anybody that follows anything in the law in the news, for instance, as you get older and older, you come to realize that this thing we think of as children of the law is not a firm brick, but it's very fluid and uh, depends on interpretations and judges' rulings and even political uh, maneuverings. Uh, how, what in the law can we count on and what do we really have to hope for the best with? Well, that's a big question. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I mean, in terms of intellectual property, I mean, the copyright law has been in place for a long time. It's well established. It works. You will definitely prevail if you've got the facts on your side. You know, the, the thing about it is it's always a question of can you collect on the, on the infringement? You know, it doesn't do you any good to spend months and months going after some guy in his basement who has no assets. You know, <laughs> mom and dad are paying the rent, but he got a hold of your stuff and is using it all over his website. You know, I mean, you know, it's going to be hard for you to make that economically um, worthwhile, right? So, so that's kind of, you know, I think that's that's what you can count on in some ways is that you have to be able to, you know, you can count on the enforcement working for copyright infringement. You can't count on collection, which is always something that I try to talk to my clients about early on so that they, they have at least expectations in line. And sometimes we're, we're proven wrong and there are assets to collect and, and, and other times there aren't. So it's just something that to, to be taken into consideration. That is really interesting. Uh, it's not, it's an interesting point to notice that it might not be worth your while just to defend your copyright. But if you don't defend your copyright, even against the guy in the basement, are you setting a precedent that could put you in jeopardy later? It, you could. That's a great that's a great point because you do have a duty to protect the copyright, to protect your trademark. But you can accomplish this by sending cease and desist letters. And you know, if the use is so great that they are in fact infringing on you monetarily then you probably do need to um, pursue litigation and at least, you know, um, convince them to stop. They cease and desist. If you can get some money out of them, great. At, at a, even if you don't have a resolution, as long as you're, for, you know, you're, you're continually um, attacking them for, for using your rights, you know, I think you can make a great case that, um, that you have been, you know, that you're worthy of, of the, copyright registration or the trademark registration, and you should be able to, to um, continue to protect and own the mark. Well, who's going to make that call? Is it going to be any number of judges who will make the call that you did not go after it? Could it be a different judgment depending on where you are? Yeah, it could be really one of three places. It depends. If it's a copyright, um, you could have a state law copyright claim, and that issue will come up in the state court. If it's if, if you're suing under um, a federal copyright registration, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, you can seek relief in federal court where a federal judge will determine whether or not. I mean, and this is only if the other side raises up that you didn't protect the mark and therefore you shouldn't be able to um, reap the benefits of it. And the third place is like in trademark world would be the trademark trial and appeal board. Where, um, which is a special tribunal that handles trademark disputes. Um, what should a musician or a songwriter know about the law before they hire a lawyer? Well, they should know that their stuff's up for grabs unless they don't protect it. You know, that's that's really the main thing is to acknowledge and appreciate that this is a modern world. It's very easy for other people to get a hold of your art. Um, it's not like it's, you know, 1871 and there's one painting on a wall that someone goes and grabs and, you know, this is, I could have, you know, 5,000 pieces of art on my hard drive in 30 seconds right here as we sit here. So, it, you know, it's a modern world. You've got to be aware that people are out there and you've got to have a good sense of what you'll do if that's discovered. And, you know, as you move up the food chain in terms of making money and, being successful and being able to monetize your art gets more important 
because obviously the more popular your art becomes, you typically monetize it better, hopefully. And, um, and the more popular it gets, the more ripe for infringement uh, it becomes. Well, on the other side of that coin, uh, the Copyright Office has recently made it harder to uh, register large collections of things. And they've kind of drawn the line and say you can only register. I think it's a, a published collection with 20 items, 10 items in an unpublished collection. And these days we're creating so much content. When should you register and when should you just let it go? Well, there's, you know, there's different things that are, that are protectable, you know, if we're talking about a song, right? So the composition of the song, which is the words and music put down on notation, you know, music notation, um, that's one piece of copyrightable, protectable um, intellectual property, right? That has nothing to do with the recording of someone performing that song. So what you'll see is that um, the performances are attacked in one way, like little sets, samples and other things being used in varying degrees and varying sizes. And there's, there's really no bright line. Like if you use 16% of a song, that's it. Um, they will tell you that there is, but it's always a fact, factual determination that gets made in those cases. Um, and I think that on the other side of the, uh, of the factor, you've got, you know, um, this, the, the, this comp, the, the, the recording, I should say, sorry, the recording, or no, the, the composition is where I was going to. The composition is um, something that if the song gets very popular um, is something that's much more ripe to be taken. And, and there's, you know, because that, that's, you, you owe, you know, uh, a license fee to the composition owner every time you record their composition. It's called a mechanical royalty. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's two ways to go about it. There's the, you know, protecting the composition and protecting the performance. And performance, uh, performance is, you know, if you have some success, you're gonna probably be with CSAC or BMI or ASCAP, which are performing rights organizations that scour the world for use of your performance. And if they find that it's happened or use of, you know, playing of your song, say at a big concert or in front of a lot of people, um, and some other kind of events, um, you know, they will then seek to enforce the copyright and and get paid. Yeah, for you. Yeah. And them. Well, could you describe the difference? You've mentioned the word trademark a few times, and there is a difference between simply registering a copyright and owning a trademark. Um, in fact, there's a big difference. Could you talk about that? Sure. Trademark is all about who who is the person or a company that injected this this good or service into the stream of commerce okay that's all it's about we want to know who created this who's responsible for it how do we know who did this um and it's trademark is literally the oldest law because it's it, it's been used for hundreds of years um ever since the magna carta was when it was first codified and um you know it's like a seal a brand a stamp all these were original trademarks and so it, people were stealing each other's brands and seals and copywriting them and, or cop, counterfeiting them and taking them. And so they created, you know, eventually a registry where you could register your trademark and then you would have some proof that that is your trademark, that you are the one and that you are the only one that should be able to use it. That's trademark. Copyright is about protecting the tangible expression of an idea or the expression of an idea on a tangible medium. So those are two different things. Can it has nothing to do with the owner as much as it does with the, the art and the expression of it. Oh, I see. So you can have a trademark in something that you didn't create, but not you can't own the copyright to something you didn't create? Well, you can. Lots of people own copyrights to things that they didn't create. That's what record labels and publishing companies do. You know, um, trademark is, is, you know, is, is you telling the world, I, Chris Burney, I, Adam Cole, um, are, are injecting my injecting the services of True Remu into the world of commerce, and I want everyone to know that it's me that does it. No one else can use True Remu and the design of the words or just the you know the the word mark, as it were, um, and protect it in that way. Um, so it's whatever. more of a branding thing. 
it's trademarks all about branding. I mean, that's, it's the basis of all branding. Mm -hmm. And not every songwriter has a brand. Not every songwriter is out there trying to establish themselves as uh, Bill the songwriter. They're just songwriters and they want to protect their stuff. Uh, that's that's often true um you know bands will have trademark fights about the name of the band because mm -hmm. that's their trademark and uh, you know there's been famous cases where a band used somebody else's name from some band in sweden and you know um caused them to change their name to some degree oh fleetwood mac is a famous example uh, right, fleetwood, right. the entire band left and the manager had contractual obligations so he found himself a new band <laughs> called Fleetwood Mac and he just kept touring and there was a big court battle over that. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the difference. Yeah. Well, um, I know a lot of uh, lawyer musicians um, and lawyer music fanatics. Is there, um, this is more of a personal question, but is there an overlap in your mind between a study of the law and a study of music? Um, I see them as sort of, you know, for me personally, they kind of balance each other out because the law is sort of, uh, you know, militant and strict and clear oftentimes and requires great rigidity to rules to properly, you know, enforce it or defend against it. Um, whereas music or art, I'm having to be a musician, but that's, there's just no boundaries. So it's a nice release to get away from, you know, a desk where you've got to do certain things the right way every time. And it's not because you want to do it that way. It's because somebody else is telling you to do it that way. That's not very artistic. Whereas, you know, going down in the basement to my little recording area and, you know, cranking out, you know, a few chords and a couple of words and a melody to go with it. Nobody can tell me not to do that. So those two things, I think, are a nice balance. Huh. So, well, that's a creative outlet. Of course, there are music situations in which somebody is telling you exactly how to do something. Yeah, but I'm not getting <laughs> hired for those gigs. No, no. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about you. Uh, you are both a very fine guitarist and a wonderful songwriter. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with you for a number of years, and uh, I have to say, and I'm going to tell the whole world about your songwriting, and I wish more people could hear your songs. Uh, one of my favorites is a song called Born on the Day That Her Daddy Died, and I'm thinking... Well, I just would have killed to come up with that. That is just yeah. the most amazing title and setup for a song I've ever heard. How did you become a songwriter? Boy, you know, that's a great question. I don't know that I really am in some ways, although I have written some songs. Um, great songs, great songs. I, uh, you know, that's the Born Born is a Born on the Day is an interesting song. It actually, it, it was, I'm not going to say names, but it's, it was, <laughs> Uh, I was, um, I was, the, the impetus for it came from someone we know uh -huh. in our, in our band world. Okay. Um, and it was, um, just a funny little thing, you know, like that the, the idea of the song was guy likes a girl, um, but, or at least has a crush on the girl, but then realizes that he was born on the day that her daddy died. Was, <laughs> how was that ever going to be okay? I mean, like the minute that fact comes out, it's all over. And at least, at least that's what my feeble little mind told me. And I thought, well, that's a nice little idea for a song. So yeah, um, that's where that came from. But, you know, songs are like that. I mean, they come out of nowhere. A lot of the times you write a song. I, I find that when I've written a song and look at it, I'm like, God, that was wrong with me. <laughs> Look at those lyrics. I mean, I need a therapist or something, but, oh. uh, you know, but, um, and other times I'm like, I have no idea what that means and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it sounds like your lawyer brain is kind of coming up and saying, that's not okay. That's, that's not. <laughs> well, it's probably not just the lawyer brain. It's just the general human brain that says, well, will people like this? Is this, they won't like me if they knew I wrote this song. <laughs> I don't really give a crap about that anymore, but you know, those are all human emotions and things. Yeah. Well, when did you write your first song? When did I write my first song? Probably when I was about early twenties. You know, I, I didn't start playing guitar until I was 19. And wow. so I would say 22, 23, I had started to write some songs. Um, you know, like, first of all, a world-class songwriter like yourself knows this, like, you know, I mean, you're on a whole different level than I am, but 
you know, songs are hard, easy. Some songs are for me often easy to start and hard to finish. Yeah. You know, because you can get the, you can get the, the chord progression, you can get the melody, but then there's all these other decisions that have to be made. And like, it just gets to be like, well, the fun's over. I already know what the hook <laughs> is and how the melody goes and why it's a good song, but can't somebody come in and finish this for me? <laughs> so I've, I've, I've started a million songs and finished about seven, I think is probably the, the grand uh-huh. Well, they're very good, the ones you finished. Why don't you uh, collaborate and let someone help you finish those things? Because that's what you do when you don't want to make those decisions. That's a great question. I don't know. I probably should do that. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you to do it, but it seems like a possible solution. You will do it. <laughs> well, if you only had a lawyer to tell you you had to do it, that would take care of it. <laughs> so 19 is pretty late to get started on an instrument. What got you started at, in 19? was in my dorm you know I went to college was in a dorm um and the guy next to me was this kid from Chicago was a guy named Roger Horn uh, nice great guy and he had a little Ibanez guitar and a little tiny practice amp and one day I looked in there and he was noodling around on it and he could play a few things and like he was into Rush so he had some Rush licks and things like that and I just thought well that's the coolest thing I've ever seen so <laughs> he was like well you can play it whenever you want so I was he regretted saying that because I was in his dorm room like for hours. Like finally he's like, you know, there's a equipment store around the corner. You could go find a cheap guitar. So I went and got a guitar just like he had. Cause I'm like, it's gotta be that one. Yeah. And it was, you know, an Ibanez, which I haven't owned an Ibanez since then, but no offense to the Ibanez, Ibanez lovers out there. They're good guitars. Anyway, ever since that time I've been playing kind of continuously and, um, the thing that made me really be able to play a song, this is sort of interesting, I guess, is I actually worked at a summer camp when I was in between my college years. And um, I worked for the same camp for about five years. And in, like year four, the camp guitar player who was like this beloved elder of the camp staff and had been there forever, super funny, like just entertain a crowd like nobody, right? He was leaving. He decided he'd had enough. And he announced at the beginning of this one summer that the, it, this was his last summer. And he and I had played a little guitar. I couldn't play at all, really. I was just starting. And he was like, well, let's go. You should be the, you should be the new camp guitar player. <laughs> I'm like, you got to be out of your mind. I got to like learn all these songs and be able to play them in front of a ton of people and play with singers and, you know, and, and not just like everybody's singing at the same time, but like one person is singing and you can't screw it up because it's just her your, her voice and your guitar. So those were terrifying moments for me. I mean, I can remember the first time in the next summer when I did it, I was just, I mean, I spent the whole year just woodshedding on these camp songs, the, the, you know, Camp Town Races, all these classic old camp songs, um, you know. Um, and uh, the first time that I had to do that, sitting on the side of this hill in Boone, Iowa, in front of like 250 people, with the singer next to me singing, you know, the old rugged cross, which is like a finger style guitar piece and really lovely vocal. Um, I was terrified. I mean, I, and I screwed up a couple of times, but uh, I also, at the end of it was like, well, that's definitely, I have to do some more of that. Yeah. Did you have music growing up? Not really. You know, my parents were not musical. We had a piano um that was in the basement and no one ever touched it I took piano lessons for a while and all I remember about that is that the piano teacher's house smelled like mothballs and <laughs> that's, like, that's an, and I didn't know what those smells were really until we got older I'm like well that's what that smell was anyway I didn't really get into piano um and my parents you know my dad had a record collection but music, they weren't they weren't the kind of folks to come home and put a record on hmm. so, so- that's you like me kind of got bit by the bug late and then it took off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When did you start? Well, I mean, I was taking piano lessons from the age of about five or six and my oh. mother did play music, but it wasn't much. I mean, I didn't grow up in the kind of house where everybody played and sang together. I mean, it was pretty much just me practicing the piano and my sister playing the violin a little. It wasn't really what you call a warm musical household. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, I was kind of on my own. So I didn't even think music was something I'd seriously do until all of a sudden my senior year, my brain just clicked into gear and said, this is this is what you're going to thrive on. Senior year of high school? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Was, yeah. Um, 
so you and I were in Patience Grasshopper together, a band. We've been in two bands sure. together, and basically we played together over, I don't know, about 12 years, all, all yep. told. Patience Grasshopper for me was a real, both bands, I learned so much in those bands. I didn't think I was going to because I'd been a professional jazz musician. And when I hit right. those bands and found out I didn't know anything at all about how to be in a band, tell me about your experience. Was that, were you relatively still green when you hit those bands or had you had some experience? I, I had been in a band, you know, I had been in bands, uh, you know, I, my, I was in my first band was really just me and another guy, um, probably two years into playing. You know, playing. We were playing little like uh, cover songs down in the in in the common area of the dorm that we were in. We had a little show like four o'clock on Thursdays. We played for an hour, and I can't remember what they gave. They gave us something, but but and that you know, when I was in law school, I finally hooked up with some people that were a little cut above musically, and particularly we had a singer, uh, Michael Mersh, who was a wonderful singer, really great singer. And um, so I had written some songs and I was playing my songs for them and they were listening. They're like, well, let's go do a demo. So the play, I had recorded some of these songs at this recording studio in Des Moines. Um, and um, th they had, I said, I want to bring some more people over and let you hear us. And they're the guys there were great. And they, they heard our demo. Like we recorded a demo there, six songs, I think it was. Um, and they were like, we want to sign you to an independent deal. So we had a record deal that we all, we all the, the guys in the band were all lawyers. So we wrote the record contract, which is <laughs> overwritten, overblown record contract. You ever saw I me mean, to like protected us from every possible thing that could go on. Comet attack. Imagine like five law students pouring over this thing for hours. <laughs> and these poor guys at the record company were like, Jesus Christ, this thing's 30 pages long. We can't even get through reading it. You know, we need a lawyer to tell us what it says. <laughs> and finally, they were just like, we trust you. And so we made a record. Um, and we, after law school, we went to, you know, we'd all pass the bar and I passed the bar in Georgia. They had passed the bar in Illinois and Wisconsin, Nevada. And so everyone agreed that they would, we would work the circuit, the Chicago, Milwaukee, uh, Des Moines, Madison circuit for a year and see if we couldn't, we were kind of a Hootie and the Blowfish kind of a band. And that was when Hootie was kind of big, you know? So we were yeah. like, we can do Hootie. Yeah. Um, it didn't go anywhere. And I came to Georgia and hung my shingle out, mm -hmm. but it was fun. It was great. And I've been pretty much in bands ever since then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, there was a break there before before the, uh, the the wipes. Remember the wipes. The wipes being the proto band before Patience Grasshopper. Yeah, same, the same fundra people. fundraiser band for the preschool that we. Well, that's where we all met. Right. Right. Yeah. This is getting deep into my history here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, indeed. So, as a songwriter, are you careful about registering your copyrights, or are you like the dentist that never brushes his teeth? You know, I'm not, I should be, um, <laughs> I, I admire you because you are excellent at, at the diligence uh, in terms of doing that. You know, I sort of keep telling myself that I'm going to get these all put together in one format that I like, you know, like, you know and then I'm going to re just register that one work. Yeah. I like to give it to my kids just so they have something and, and you never know. I mean, you know, anybody could write a song that somebody else likes and buys. So, you know, you got to protect it. So you're right to do it. And I'm, I am, I'm the dentist who doesn't floss. <laughs> well, as good as these songs are, I do think you should compile the best of them. And I'd be happy to help you do that. I uh, appreciate that, man. I, I always love playing music with you. You always raise everybody up around you and you have such a great, uh, you know, feel for um, the right amount of sort of, correction and like support you know and I, and, and I say that very you don't correct anybody I think that's what I was impressed with you're a professional music educator and you've got you know a bunch of guys that are hitting the wrong chord every fifth chord and you know you, you handle it very well so we all appreciated <laughs> your uh, your niceness oh, and well. I think we understood what it was I mean it's not like we've been paid to be there but still well thank you I, I you know I mean it was worth it to me to well to play with y'all it was a lot of fun and uh you know i mean you can spend your rehearsal correcting everybody and everybody hates you or you can just let people be who they are as musicians and correct the things that are going to make a difference that's right and, and kind of where we were at that time i think that's the only way it could work but 
you know, we still, you know, I still love, love Wine in a Mug. One of the great <laughs> songs I, I think you've written. I love that song. That song is like El Rey OX, man. You got to get that to David Lindsay somehow and let him, uh, Lindley, and have him uh, record it because it's a classic El Rey OX song. Yeah, well, that's you playing on it. So if folks go to Demo Crazy, you can hear Wine in a Mug played with me and with Mr. Chris Burney. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and I want to thank you also for the legal help you've given me as far as lawyers go. I haven't had lots of lawyers, but I can tell you I, I do appreciate how easy you make it and how clear everything is. You've always done a stellar job in that regard. Thank you. Well, thank you, man. It's been a pleasure working with you. And tell us, okay, let's say people want to at least hire you as a lawyer. How can they find you? They can find me at BernieLawFirm.com, B-E-R-N-E-Y, LawFirm.com. Um, there's a link there to contact me and my staff will get in touch with anybody. I, I, my philosophy is I'll give anybody 15 minutes because you never know who, you know, when that perfect situation will walk through the door. And I just love talking to people about what they're trying to do. There's nothing like somebody who's riding that wave of excitement that they've been riding usually for a couple of weeks, maybe a month before they call the lawyer and they're still riding it. And it's just really I really love telling them that they're totally wrong and they've got to slow down and back up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oftentimes I have to, like you in the band with us, I have to not do that because, you know, you know, it happens. People come up and they say, I've got this wonderful name for my business. It's going to be, this is the name of it. Me and my high school buddy, we, we, we hung out for years. We were 20 years. We didn't see each other, but the last couple of years we've gotten back together. We're forming this business. We think we're going to do this, but here's the name of the business. Don't you love it? And then, you know, 30 seconds of searching on the trademark side, like, no, that, that, there's already a, a taco restaurant named that name. So we <laughs> Kool-Aid. That's our business. So I don't like, I like to, you know, I try to do it in a way to like help some understand how to create a different name that can be protected and leave them on a good note. But, but um, I love talking to people about their, what they're excited about. I'll always love that. So. I encourage your listeners to give me a call if I can help them in any way. And until the album comes out, are you sharing any of your music? Can people hear it? Um, we are on SoundCloud, but it's mostly just rehearsal cuts right now. I'd have to look. I don't have any of my stuff up currently. Okay. Uh, but maybe I'll maybe I'll do that. Maybe you'll, you've inspired me. Please, I encourage you to do it. I, I, I know I'm effusive in my praise, but I don't effuse. Uh, in vain. I only effuse when I really believe something's awesome. And I do think your songs are just awesome. I do. It's true. I do have some videos on, on YouTube, uh, which some original stuff and, and some covers. Uh, we did an original song on there with Annette, remember? Yeah. You're talking about um, uh, South Dakota. Uh, South Dakota. Yeah. That's a really great, that song, that was one of my I don't collaborate often. It was a really nice collaboration. I thought it was just perfect. And remember, if you recall, it was like we had to do it in like two hours or one night. Right. You know? right yeah. So like figuring it out and coming back later. So we sat there in a in a round and just worked it out right there. That was so cool. But yeah, um, let me see. It's under it's CPBATL at which is my handle on YouTube. Okay, CPBATL on YouTube. You can actually watch us do It's Too Quiet in South Dakota. That's awesome. It's too quiet. <laughs> Great. Chris Burney, thank you so much for taking the time to help us understand things about the law and about who you are. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure. It's great to see you. Thank you. And it's great to see you too, audience. Thank you for joining us for yet another one of these wonderful interviews. If you like them, please like. And if you want to subscribe to us, we'd love to have you join the community. There's a new interview every week, and there's other goodies on the site, too. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Adam.